So I think that um, it's uh, five after. And so I think I would like to um, start this webinar and I'd like to turn it over to Rebecca who will um, be our first lead speaker. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, based on, on where you're at. Um, I am really excited to be a part of this webinar. If you'll go back to the first slide, Suzanne. Yes, I just so, know. This, this particular webinar, to the one that has the title on it, the other direction. Boy, we got there the one go. today here. <laughs> one more, one more. All right, there we go. There we are. Okay. okay, so hopefully you're in the right webinar. It is TBR <laughs> Services to Groups. We're going to talk today about the who, what, why, when, and where of providing services. And uh, Lenore and I are going to briefly introduce ourselves. My name is Rebecca Holland, and I am coming to you from beautiful, leaf-turning fall, Montana. Um, we have been here for just about two months. We moved from New Mexico at the end of July, and uh, it's been a major life change for us. I uh, have had a combined total of 14 years as an AVERS uh, pro program manager. I worked at the Pueblo of Jemez in New Mexico during that time frame, and uh, loved every day of my work. I definitely did not leave because I was unhappy. Uh, left to be near my grandchildren, which I get to see now every single week, which is amazing. I have a background in uh, as a vocational rehabilitation counselor, a CRC in that. I've also graduated from Pet Air from San Diego State, and uh, currently I'm working with Avertac as one of their content experts. So. I'm delighted to be back among you in whatever way I can because I miss all of you a lot. So, Lenore, would you introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Lenore Curell. I'm the um, project director for the United Home and Asian uh, VR program here in Louisiana. Um, I, October 1st will make 20 years for me um, here. Mm -hmm. um, and. Uh, I, I'm excited because I think, I think I may have learned something in 20 years, you know, a little bit. And, um, you know, I, I, I have a really diverse and interesting background coming into Voc Rehab. Uh, I actually have a business background. Um, and so, um, but came into this program and fell in love and uh, loved the work and, and loved the people and, and, and just the, the mission of what we do. Um, I'm the current president for KNR and um, just work in whatever ways we can to um, further our, our programs and, and doing what we can. I have a huge love of uh, training. I, I think I'm a, I'm a super geek at heart and um, I like deep diving. And, and so, um, you know, I, I think, you know, being able to discover and figure out new ways to do things I, is, is really exciting for me. Well, and I'm really happy and thrilled to present with Lenore because Lenore is one of my favorite people and we've done a lot through the years. And so we're going to tag team today, which means we're not going to just lecture and present to you. We really want this to be an interactive webinar. So there'll be times throughout the PowerPoint where we'll stop and we're going to ask you to make comments or provide questions. Um, because we know that in, in this family, we learn the best from each other. And, you know, I'm not coming to you as an expert regarding this. I've got some experience in it, but I'm not an expert. And I think, Lenore, you would say you're not really an expert in this area, too. So um, be thinking about questions you might have and comments that you can contribute to the conversation as we go along. So, so let's talk very quickly about the purpose of the webinar. Um, this would be the next slide. And the purpose is to define and discuss services to groups and best practices for implementing and executing group services within AVERS programs. And then our learning objectives for the day 
There are a few of them. We're gonna talk about the federal regulations and how they define services to groups. We're not gonna bore you. We're not gonna take you through every detail and insult your intelligence to read it on your own. We are gonna tell you where you can find it. We're also going to share some key points from it so that we have an understanding of what it says. But I'm gonna be real honest with you. It's very simple in terms of, well, I shouldn't say simple. It's very small in terms of how much is said about services to groups. The second thing is we want to discuss why and when to consider providing services to groups. This is really important, especially right now in the midst of COVID-19. And we want to discuss factors to consider when developing services to groups and where to start your planning. And then finally, we want to go a little bit deeper. And this may seem like, you know, wow, it's kind of a lofty plan to do all of these things, but we want to go a little deeper into the scope of allowable services. And we wanna talk about examples and have some discussion about what has been done. So let's jump right in and I'm gonna just briefly share why this webinar. You know, I think for me, just as a program manager in an Abers program, this was always a mystery category for me. Um, people would kind of share There'd be a little bit said, but there was never anything in depth when it came to services with group and I uh, to groups. And I think that Lenore and I want to remove some of that mystery. You know, we want to talk about, you know, how things are connected to the federal regs and and how we have to go through the process of actually thinking about the plan and implementing a plan. But we want to have that deeper conversation today. You know, if you look, there's only two specific places in the regs and the law that talk about services to groups. So again, there's not a lot said. And then the final thing is that during this time of COVID-19, we are all very aware that many AVERS programs have significant carryover funds and those carryover funds can be used for services to groups based on what it is that will work the best in your community. So at this point, we want to pause and we want to let Suzanne uh, Malson talk to us about two great opportunities you have just by participating in this conference. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, whoops, I touched something I shouldn't have. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, anyway, I'll get back to that. Um, the good news is, is that Winona Reed from Avertac has been working with uh, Mary Maruvia from the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indian Tribal VR Program and representatives from NAU and from uh, University of Washington and has, um, and, they, and the outcome is that there will be CRC credits available, one credit available at the, uh, for participating in this particular webinar. We also have a completion certificate that will be available um, to you as well. And uh, we had a discussion this morning and um, the goal is that if you want CRC credits uh, or you want a completion certificate, please email, and John is going to put it in the chat box, uh, the avertech.nau.edu email and uh, we'll be sure that you get those documents that you need in order to uh, acquire uh, your certificates uh, uh, after today's webinar. Um, we have a way of monitoring you through, um, through your, so that your participation that you stay with us for the full hour. Uh, some of you can put, uh, you can maybe write something to Winona uh, in the chat box is a way to, to do a private, to let her know that you're interested in the CRCs. Okay, so now I need to find, thank you. And if there are any questions, you can, uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask that at the end of it or send an email. So let me see, I need to make sure, what one am I missing? Just advance it. One. Yeah, just, just advance it. So Lenore, you're up. Mm -hmm. There we go. Sorry, I. All I have to do is touch something and everything goes. <laughs> okay, 
okay, you're up, Lenore. Yeah, so the, the whole thought of this is, is that services to groups, um, I will say, I think allows you to creatively approach um, the work that you do. And so thinking through if there's ever been, an, a, if you've ever had an idea of a way to serve a group of consumers or, and wondered if it would work. Um, and, and so this is where if we can just kind of think off, if you guys want to add in the chat, maybe some ideas you've had. Um, and this is what I would say is, is like, if you've ever had a nagging, nagging feeling um, that there might be a better way to serve a group of consumers um, instead of doing it individually, that if, if there were something in place that you could do uh, across a bigger scope that, that would actually be of better service to them um, and ideally fix an issue, um, more so, or is there an unmet need or a barrier um, that seems to be impacting a, a, a whole set of people? Um, that, that's what services to groups can do. Um, so let's have an, an, a, a chance to kind of think about and you guys give us some ideas of what have you thought about or, or things that have stuck with you, because we'd love to be able to bring that along throughout our discussion. And so if we can do a, a real quick round robin, if you guys want to just quickly share some ideas or share it in the chat. Everybody can wake up now. <laughs> That's right. Well, I had an idea when, um, when I was a uh, director um, you know, trying to provide services to one person who had a significant disability, but, um, and didn't have like the technology at home or could afford the technology or we couldn't afford the, or justify the technology of providing uh, a teaching tool for reading. And so do any of you have any ideas how one person um, can benefit from that kind of service? Like what kind of service would be available? We used uh, the department of our, our tribal department of education. Think about something outside the box. Okay, so Winona talked about a motivational speaker um, and Jamie, a typing course. Um, so those are all things that potentially, you know, again, of, of helping people move along. Um, so that's great. That gives us ideas of how to plug that in. And, and again, keep thinking about ideas, plug it into the chat, and, and we can always come back to that. Um, next slide. So the who. So who can be assisted with services to groups? And, and who will be your partners? Um, what I, I want to think about is, is so the who we would normally assume is going to be your consumers, right? I think we can all kind of agree is, is we're thinking services to groups is a group of our consumers. And of course, that would be the case. The other thing is, is in the process of providing services to our consumers, we may inadvertently provide a service that serves multiple people. Um, and so, um, we were chatting earlier and I said, it's almost like the, the idea of when they do curb cuts and they invented curb cuts to, for folks in wheelchairs is how many other folks benefit from, from that, that use is, is tons, tons of folks, you know, moms with their strollers, um, that kind of stuff. And, and so it doesn't mean it can only be your consumers that can benefit from it, but you're looking at it from the lens of your consumers and that how it will be benefit your consumers. Um, and then the other thing is, is we don't do any of this stuff in, in a vacuum. And so who needs to be your partners that you may need assistance to be able to do this? So are there tribal programs that, um, can provide assistance or help along the way, a tribal enterprise, 
Um, if there's a community rehab program in your community, schools, state VR, is there assistance from someone else that would help to be able to make that um, potentially better? Uh, Lenore, you have some things in the chat box. Yeah. Um, did you want to look at it now or do you want to wait until later? Recommend, are there ideas about um, classes, like feeding classes from Winona? Um, a community garden, is that a possibility? Rachel had to comment. Okay. And at this point, I'm just taking down the information because when we're going through all of those things, we'll, we'll go ahead and, and do that. Um, okay. School supplies to the youth. So, um, Suzanne, you want to advance the slide to who answered, um, just so that we can kind of show and have everybody aware that, just as Lenore said, the services that we provide to groups, they're going to benefit individuals with disabilities. And if you look at what the regulations and the law says, is that it says, services to groups should benefit individuals with disabilities. It doesn't spell out clients or consumers or, so that's an amazing thing when you think about that. And some of these ideas that are being put in the chat box are exactly, exactly spot on uh, of things that can be provided. And it's exciting to see you guys generate those, those responses. Mm -hmm. So let's move now and let's talk about the next, which is the when. Um, so, so Lenora did a great job talking about the who. Now we want to look at the when. So when you think about providing services to groups, what comes to mind? And, you know, I remember years ago I had an idea and I thought it might fall in the category of services to groups. And all I could think about was, help somebody help me <laughs> I, I i didn't know where to start i i just there were so many questions and so next slide please the the questions that come up when you think about when is okay well where do i start in this process you know what's step one and and i would say that there really isn't a step one it's kind of cyclical you know it's not linear you're going to bounce around a little bit as you think about providing services to groups so you think about where do you start then you think about well who can i talk to and this is a great platform right now of, of sharing some ideas and things of who you can talk to about the things you're thinking about. And then what have others done? And this is another great platform to share what you've done, what's worked, what's been approved by our project officers. And then when do I implement this? You know, do I do it at the beginning of the year when I, you know, I'm just starting my budget? Do I do it in the middle? Do I do it at the end when I know how much money is left? I mean, when do I implement it? Maybe it's seasonal, do I, and I have to implement it at a time that has to do with what the weather's doing. And then the last thing really under this area is, is it feasible or possible? Um, you know, sometimes we have great ideas, but when we look at the communities we're serving, we know it is not going to be possible because of all the barriers we're facing in especially rural communities. So we want to look at these things. And, and I would guess that you guys have some other things that you could think about that when you're, when you're starting to form an idea, what are some other questions that you would think about um, asking yourself or maybe seeking more information on? Do any of you have other questions? And we can do this in the chat box or we can, you can unmute and just share. What are other questions you have when you have an idea? Okay, this is Burdett. Uh, in regards to the feasibility, I would, under there, maybe list what are the barriers that um, would uh, get in the way from going on with the program? And that's excellent. 
That is so good. What are the barriers you might be facing? Somebody else, I think, started to talk. No, I was just going to just share that on the chat, there's a lot of discussion about youth collaboratives of uh, what looks like almost um, some work readiness opportunities um, with other partners, which is great. Absolutely. Um, sustainability, does, does whatever you're thinking about, how can it sustain after you know, a neighbor's program is no longer involved? That's a really good thing to, to ask yourself when you're thinking about an idea. Anybody else with an idea, question of what you would ask yourself when you're thinking about a service to a group? I, this is Karen. I think one of the things that um, we think about or that we've talked about in the past uh, beyond information that I put in the notes was uh, we were holding um, with several other groups, Tribal Youth Center and um, the Ojibwe College, a uh, Fry Bread Friday. Um, and during this time, um, we would uh, for instance, there's a sugar bush out back. So we'd go out back and, and work with the maple syrup and, and teach, you know, parents, um, many of which were also my consumers to do this. But one of the things that I think that we found is that um, supplying like food or snacks for the event, um, you have to have the right it has to be in the right category. It has to be the right reasoning, but you have to be very careful about that. Right. And, and that's really good, Karen, because you're, you're kind of falling in what Burdette just said, which is, is um, you know, what are the barriers? What are the things you're going to have to face that might make that idea difficult? So good example. In the chat, also, uh, sorry. Yeah. I, I, there's Winona. What communication is needed between the Avers program and their project officer in regards to services to groups? So that's, you know, one of those questions you might need to ask. And Angelina talks about subsistence as a cultural activity done seasonally. TVR can purchase fishing licenses, bury buckets and do an outing, et cetera. And Rachel talks about, we are working to help develop improve a community rehab program in our service area. It includes gardening aspects in response to my, my question, can gardening be part of it? Thank you, Rachel. And from Tammy, how much to spend on venue, uh, presenters, groups? Lee uh, uh, says, how are services to groups documented in the consumer's IPE? <laughs> Winona Reed, good question, Lee. Yes. <laughs> Question, Lee. Oh, that's what she said. And then Joanne comes in and says, can I uh, charge community members a fee to help cover the cost of the activity? Uh, Rachel, um, did you want to take this over, <laughs> Lenore? <laughs> well, I think that I we have to go back and like kind of deal with one at a time, which is, yeah. becomes, yeah. So let's go back to Winona's question of the communication with your project officers. Um, okay. regarding services to groups it is that the, the regulations allow you to provide services to groups. The, the issue becomes is when you're providing services to groups that's not in conjunction with your current plan. And so if you're proposing to do something and here we get into some of the fiscal things and this has been something that's been going around on, on the listserv is um, this is something Rebecca and I both agree. It is more than likely your services to groups in most cases are going to be above the $5,000 threshold often. Um, it may not be, but typically it will be. Um, and so typically at that point is, is it's, it's not so much that you're saying, I need your permission to do services to groups. It's because I need to do this level of spending. Um, and then this is how it will benefit my consumers and being able to justify that. Rebecca, yeah, would you? 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. The other piece of that is that it, it may be that you need to make an adjustment to a goal or an objective and you need to talk through with your project officer how to do that so you can actually add a service to a group. So what Lenore just shared is, is spot on is that you know, you've got to have communication with the project officer, but sometimes it's based on the dollar amount and sometimes it's based on slightly adding to your goals and objectives so that you can meet that need that you see. And um, I, I, I think it's wonderful. You guys are kind of, I think, giving each other ideas and, and feedback. Um, Rachel's response, yes. Sometimes your funds can be utilized to help build um, a community rehab program in your, your community. So if there is, um, let's say, a fledgling CRP program in your community that needs um, a little boost, so to speak, or something like that, is, is there, that is something that you can work together you know, in, in order to do that. It's something that has to be very well thought out, you know, and being very clear about what your contribution to that is, um, you know, because you don't want to own the CRP at the end of the day, and you don't want to just be giving things over. At the end of the day, you want them, whatever your contribution is, is going to benefit your consumers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just being good stewards of your money. Um, to that extent. Uh, but at the same time, it's really difficult to operate without a CRP in your community to deal with some of the things you don't have time and effort to do, um, or the staff capacity to do. Um, how much to spend on venue presenters, groups, um, I, you know, that gets back to the fiscal regulations of those nice things that talk about um, being prudent with your money, um, you know, is it allocable, allocable, allowable, and reasonable? Um, I like to think of present, you know, when I think of what's reasonable amounts is, is you know, to think of the person in your life that, that you know, has been really the most prudent. So I think of my grandma who used to roll up all her little dollar bills and put them in her purse and that kind of stuff. And I was like, you know, would, 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 would my grandma reach into her her purse to pay for this at that amount? Would she think that was reasonable? You know, kind of thing. And and you know, so so I think that's the thing you've got to got to recognize is is um, it's okay to spend money, but you don't want to spend it frivolously. And so that that requires judgment um, to that extent. What I pay for a venue compared to what you guys may pay for a venue up in Washington State are going to be totally different you know, based on our cost of living. Agreed. Um, there's some other fabulous questions on here. We obviously can't answer all of them, but I do want to, to call out, um, so Christopher um, put on here a question. He said, I'm under the impression services to groups means only people who have applied for and have been determined eligible for TBR services. Is that correct? You know, if you read the regulations, it doesn't say that specifically. It says can benefit a group of individuals with disabilities. So, you know, I think I I think it was Rachel who a couple of years ago talked about putting in a swimming pool chair for people with disabilities to be able to be lowered into the community swimming pool. And it benefited her consumers, but it also benefited anybody with a disability in that community that went to use the swimming pool. So, so there, are, there are times when this service is gonna benefit anybody with a disability, not just our consumers. We design it and we put it together based on our consumers' needs, what we're seeing, but it may benefit the entire community. So hopefully that helps a little bit with that. So um, we'll come back to some of these and uh, Lenora's going to talk about the why. Yeah, so and, and some of your questions actually hit on the why. So why would a program consider services to groups? Um, let's go to the next uh, slide. So they have a group of consumers that actually can benefit um, from this. They have an idea that matches the definition for services to groups. 
um, TVR program has money in their client service budget that will allow for this. So let's face it, in the world of post, you know, not post, mid COVID-19, I'm sure there are a lot of folks sitting there with extra funds. Um, so this may be an opportunity um, to move in this direction. Um, you know, because that becomes the, the other issue is, is uh, when Rebecca was talking about the wind is, is also opportunities of when, when you can and when the finances kind of the sun, moon and stars align to make all of those things happen is, is this may be great opportunities to address some of these issues. Um, and, you know, that you may have explored the idea with your community, your staff, your supervisors, even your project directors, and you, there's positive feedback. So folks think, think it, it's a doable op option. I, I will say, um, for me, I think of, you know, um, and I saw one of the questions was, is, ha has the states implemented this? I don't know that the states have really um, hugely implemented services to groups. Um, what I what I will say is is in you know is tribally we interact as a community in a very different way than what takes place I would say in the general VR program um, and so services to groups may actually even though it's kind of scary because it's very vague in the regulations and so vague means do i get my hand slapped and you know because i'm doing something wrong or is it an opportunity for us to truly um better meet the needs of our consumers in uh, by by being more culturally sensitive and so one of the things um i would say in in you know rebecca and i had this conversation going in is is so one of the things is why is is you know which makes our programs different is is the the whole concept of being able to do um culturally appropriate services and and traditional healing so is traditional healing done as a service to groups? Would that be a more effective way to approach it as opposed to individually? Um, and then it becomes more palatable for our consumers because maybe that's more of the approach in, within the community. And so I think we have to think of it of what may be more culturally appropriate as well of the why in, in our, within our own communities. good. So Rachel did point out that when she did the pool lift, that was before regulations changed. And so it is important. That is, that is why, in honesty, in this day and age, with so many things changing quickly, you want to have that conversation with your project officer about the idea you're having, you know, and specifically if it, if it falls in line with what the regulations are saying or will allow. So... Lenore, were you finished? Yes, I, I am on that one. Unless there was feedback from, I'm sorry, the um, the chat. No, not much feedback. All right, well, continue to add things as, as they come up for you, questions or thoughts, and we'll get to those as we can. And so we're gonna talk now about what? What are the factors to consider when developing services with groups and or two groups? And the truth is, there's a lot of them to consider. You know, in, in a little bit, Lenore is going to talk about the big federal regulations and those federal regulations for TVR or AVERS programs comes out of two sections of the federal regulations and then one out of the law. And she's going to hit or bullet point some of those so that you have an idea of what it says. But your definition has to fit within those federal regulations. And then you want to look at, will it benefit the consumers? Yes, we might be looking at the community as a whole or, you know, those with disabilities, but will it specifically benefit your consumers? And that's a key element. Um, I'm going to be honest right now and say, I don't know the answer to Lee's question about does it need to be documented or how do you document services to groups into a consumer's IPE. I guess if, if you have a number of consumers and you're going to develop something that would be, 
be fitting for them, you would want it to be in that IPE, but I'm not sure how it's completely documented. Lenore, do you know that? The it doesn't to necessarily have to be um, when it's services to groups. Um, the biggest thing is the justification of why you're spending the money and how it will benefit folks. So um, I, I will I will share, uh, we have had um, uh, a couple of projects where we've done services to groups and um, one in particular I had to get a, a authorization for RSA because we were over the threshold of spending. Um, and so I had to give a, um, an estimation of how many people that I think were going to be served by the, um, the project and, and, and being able to answer that question. So it was part of my justification. The other thing is that when you do your reporting, you report on services to groups a little bit different than you do on some of the other services in the IPE or the IPE. So I, I'm, you know, I'm not 100% sure about that answer, but um, thank you, Lenore, for jumping in. One of the things that if it starts out with, it's one individual that you're working with, and other people benefit from it, then the, then it can be placed in the IPE because it's for the individual. Right. Uh, it meets the individual for the IPE, and then you would have to, uh, and, and there's a possibility that you don't have to justify it for um, actually benefiting from it. Well, and if you look at the regulations and you look at the law, they're very separate. You know, you have VR services which are all listed that would go into an individual's IPE. And then you have the second category of services to groups. So um, I'm sure the documentation is a little different. So the next thing I wanna point out on here is that it's important you look at, do we have the funds? And this, you know, this is critical, not just to, do we have the funds to get this up and going, but also you know, the next questions that come after it, do we have the time to develop it and can we monitor the outcome? So all of these come together to say, it's not just the funds to get something up and going, but how will we sustain it? Because it is a shame when something gets created for services to groups and then it can't be continued. And really what RSA is gonna look at is sustainability and, you know, towards the end of our presentation, I'm going to talk about the self-employment workshop that we put together and really how we've been able to sustain that through, um, through the years. And that was a critical element that I was asked when we presented the idea is how will you then sustain um, what goes into the workshop? So all of these things need to be considered when you're specifically looking at the what in developing services with groups. So Rebecca, there was a question about um, the spending threshold. Um, and, and so I did share in the chat, the, the rule of thumb in general, um, without hugely deep diving on the fiscal regulations, is um, typically an individual item that's gonna be $5,000 or more. It'll be considered inventory, um, not inventory, Lord, uh, equipment. Right. and uh it, it becomes part of your inventory um and or it or it's multiple items that when combined serve a specific purpose um and so that's kind of the threshold that when you have to request additional uh, permission so a good example of that is let's say you're going to purchase a computer and a printer and you know all of you know a, a DVD player and a scanner or whatever, and all of those items together come to five thousand, you know six hundred dollars. Then you have to get approval because those items together are going to be over that threshold. Um, if you're going to purchase, you know, a, a one thing and it's four thousand five hundred, then it's not over that threshold. So. Uh, Christopher points out that sometimes thresholds are lower than the 5,000. Correct. And in that case, RSA will make you go with your tribe's threshold. And I've already moved to the where. 
So the, the, the whole issue is, is where do you even start to develop your services? Um, and then the key part of this too, because you, you know, at the end of the day, everything comes back to your grant. We are grant based programs. And so where does it fit into your overall goals and objectives for your program? You can go to the next slide. I push it and sometimes it doesn't go. <laughs> That's okay. So you start with your idea and being able to flesh that out. Um, and, and again, like don't, don't do that alone. Get, bring in your stakeholders, your folks, the other folks that need to be a part of that. If there's partners that need to, to help with that process, bring your consumers along, get their ideas. If they're gonna be con the consumers of those services, you know, there has to be buy-in for that. Then go back and read the regulations. So if you've confirmed what that idea is, is the regulations and making sure your, I your ideas fit on what's an allowable area. So there's no magic area that has what or allowable expenses under groups to services, it, it, it's the same as your normal services and those kinds of things. It still falls within those same fiscal guidelines and those kinds of things and being able to match those. But go back and revisit it, making sure that, you know, there, there's no question that you're within those federal guidelines. Um, make sure you have the funds in your budget to support it and that it, it that it that it will not take away from your service of your current IPEs, you know. So, and, and the other thing I, I I would say is is also the maintenance of it after the fact is not only in that moment, but it, it is their maintenance of it in future years. So if so, as we're looking in this COVID world, and we have these chunks of funds sitting there right now, is is those funds may not be there, and they're probably not going to be there in two years. Um, but will that service to groups that you're establishing and working on still be viable, even if there's no additional funds or, you know, and being able to think through that process. Um, and so the maintenance, hugely important, developing justification. So more than likely, you're going to have to justify it to RSA, your project officer. Um, and making sure it matches the vision of where you're going, your need for your consumers. Um, I will say this, if you are in your fourth, fifth year and you're asking for, um, for whatever reason, RSA is particularly, if you want to say, well, we need a vehicle <laughs> in fourth or fifth year, they say no. Um, and that kind of stuff. So, you know, if you're on the tail end of your grant period and you're proposing something um, hugely innovative or and that kind of stuff, just be ready to answer those questions. I don't. I, I'm. I'm saying you can still make that pitch, but be ready with your best pitch to move forward. Um, because you're at the tail end of your grant, be don't don't be surprised to get some resistance. Um, and then contact your project officer to share your idea with him or her prior to approval. Um, my recommendation for anybody um, to, when talking with your project officer is never ask a yes, no answer. <laughs> a yes, no question. Because the answer usually is always going to be no. You ask the how. <laughs> how can I? Because then it allows them and it brings them into your creative process. Um, within that, because usually, you know, it always comes back to is it, well, can, can I do this? Well, no, yeah, <laughs> don't get the further discussion. So, so I think, you know, when you're, you're seeking that kind of guidance, be aware that you want a fuller discussion with your project officer. You want them to be your partner on this and not just the bad guy. So I just wanted to say that Christopher had a wonderful comment. He said, for those whose grants were extended this year and will have to turn in a proposal next year. Sorry, everyone. My dogs are not happy that my husband seems to be opening the garage door. So <laughs> let me start that again. And you guys be quiet. 
For those whose grants were extended this year and will have to turn in a proposal next year, this is a great discussion. There is an opportunity to write into a grant proposal some services to groups with all the associated costs above 5,000, and you're absolutely right about that. That's perfect timing for those that are getting ready to write those proposals. So go ahead, Lenore. No, no. So um, let's, um, let's look at what the 371.6, um, the services to groups, so where it talks about vocational rehabilitation services for groups of individuals that it's provided for the benefit of groups of individuals with disabilities. So, so like Rebecca said, so that may be provided to uh, by the, the tribal vocational unit and may include the following. And so it's kind of lengthy. Um, go in and deep dive on that. Um, it, so some of the things it highlights, so in the case of any small business enterprise operated by individuals, with significant disabilities under the supervision of the TVR program unit, management services and supervision provided by the tribal VR rehab unit, along with the acquisition. So, you know, if you kind of have insomnia and you can't go to sleep, this is great reading. Um, <laughs> sorry. You, know, sorry, you know, that's how the regs read, but you know, you pick through them. Um, but it's the acquisition of uh, vending facilities, other equipment, initial stocks and supplies uh, with the following requirements. So you've got to have the management services, including inspection, quality control, consultation. So it gives you some really great guidance on how to do some of this stuff. Um, I, I will say, um, I know uh, over in Hamas, there was a, um, a self-employment workshop that was developed. Is anybody else doing self-employment workshops? Because that's a great opportunity. I think particularly a, a huge challenge in a lot of the tribal communities is the unemployment rates. And so with few jobs available, you know, unemployment really is the best option for some folks because there's just no jobs out there. And so being able to, to help someone move in that direction, um, but it gives the guidance in here of the small business enterprise model and, and what and how the, those guidelines for you. So I would say you go back and, and look at that. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit that, about that when we, the next thing we're gonna look at are some examples. So we'll talk about that when we get there. Yeah. And so, you know, it's really about um, going through those different sections, making sure you feel comfortable with them and, and getting, getting this done. So, so again, like I'm not gonna read it to you, but you, you've, you've got a lot of leeway. Um, it, it's going back and looking at those and then being able to, again, like, getting permission whenever you need to, to know it and when you've got to be able to do that. Well, and one thing I want to say is that the, the regulations break it into nine sections and then under each section, um, it talks about some of the specifics of that. So if you have an idea for transition students, there's a section that talks about transition students. If you want to work with a community CRP, there's a section that talks about how you can do that. If you wanna do telecommunications of some kind, there's a section that talks about that. And it's broken down into nine specific areas. Again, you know, it, it, it documents for you what is included in that. And it lets you know whether your idea would fall under one of those categories. You know, sometimes you're gonna have an idea and it's not gonna fall under one of those categories. And I really like what Lenore said, talk to your project officer about how. <laughs> because sometimes they can help you be creative in coming up with a way that connects to one of these nine areas. And then you can facilitate that service to group. It may not look exactly like your picture of it did, but you might be able to bring in partners that can add to it to make it look exactly like you want it to. So it's very important 
that you you know what these say and how your idea would fit into these specific areas. Um, are there any questions in the chat that has to do with that or? Yes. Okay, so some people are also talking about that they're beginning to work on self-employment workshop for consumers. Um, there's some recommendations, self-employment native crafters to attend the Small Business Administration on self-employment. Um, just some great comments, things that people are doing. Rachel said, we've supplied, su purchased supplies and have developed a tentative list of instructors. So they're really beginning to move forward on that. And Joanna said, our tribe's loan department is providing outreach and webinars to people who are interested in self-employment. So this is great in identifying who could be potential partners if you decide to put together one of these um, ideas in a service to groups. The other thing, going back to some of the comments folks made in the beginning uh, were um, like the typing class. So if, if you have um, a large number of clerical opportunities in your community and, and that's an area where folks really need you know additional training is that's an easy service to groups you you can contract someone to come in and do a class um, and where you would actually tie that back into the IPE is you may require a consumer to attend that class in their IPE um, and that kind of stuff and so being able to do that um, your beating class, again, that becomes part of, I'm assuming that's like the self-employment option, which I think is huge for a lot of tribal communities and being able to do that. Um, community garden, again, being able to relate it back to is, is how, are we, how are we fixing a problem? Right. So how is that community garden fixing a problem? Now, is the community garden a work experience opportunity? Mm -hmm. Does it make sure that you can see if someone shows up every day? They, or are they committed? Um, it, the other piece of that is the independent living skills. You know, is it somebody who's maybe in a supported employment uh, plan and it's providing some independent living skills or, you know, work experience, things like that, that that can be benefited by a whole group of individuals that maybe haven't been served before. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at the fishing and most people would probably be going, how on earth do we justify fishing and having people doing fishing in it? And so my thing is, is if it's a culturally appropriate way for people to gather and you need to see how your consumers work in a group of people, and how their social interaction is, right. that could be a service to groups. Because it becomes assessments to a certain extent. True. You know, so, so I think it becomes things of being able to figure out how do you think out of outside the box, the box, so to speak. Um, think of what's unique for your own community and what problem are you trying to solve? Um, and, and what ways make the most sense for it, um, you know, to be able to do that. Well, and also with the new emphasis on transition work with students with disabilities, this opens up a whole new area for really TBR programs in providing those transition mm -hmm. students with group activities. And so we're going to look at some examples, but for many of you, especially those of you who might be writing a new proposal next year, or maybe had submitted yours and have to resubmit it. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that happened. Um, anyway, I would suggest if you didn't think about it, that you think about how you're going to possibly provide services to groups of transition students, because that's really um, key right now and really on everybody's mind, especially in in light of Priet's pre services and what states have to do. And so you, one thing I found in New Mexico is that when we wanted to do something with a group of transition students, 
state VR was there because they needed to fulfill some Prietz requirements. So we were able to collaborate very easily on so many different projects because they wanted to get those numbers. So keep that in mind. So let's look at some examples and then we're gonna ask you all to really not just share in the chat box, but, but share verbally with us um, some of your examples of what you've done or what you're thinking about. So the first one is creating a self-employment workshop. I'll just very briefly tell you what we did in Hamas years ago. And this, some of this was before some of the regs were changed. So what we did was we saw that we were spending a lot of money on individual plans for self-employment and a lot of them didn't carry, didn't follow through and we were frustrated. And so we had the idea of creating a self-employment workshop and we had a consumer at the time who was um, being trained in construction work. And so we had the idea and presented it to our project officer of having this consumer and construction work build the workshop so it wasn't a construction project. Our program would buy the materials, he would build it as part of his training. And then we would use past consumers who had been successful in self-employment businesses to come in and not only provide training to new consumers, but also mentorship in the process of living with a disability and the small business process and working with VR in that whole arena. And we were able to build a workshop that had a large kiln in it, as well as everything needed to do silver work and leather work and woodworking and bead work and sewing. And so all the trades that were common in the community, all the, the arts and crafts. And then what we have done through the years is we fire pottery in that kiln for the community members. And we charge a fee for that. And all of the money that comes in through that goes right back into the workshop to continue to purchase supplies that are needed. So this gives us the ability when somebody wants to do self-employment to put them through a work experience, a training time in the workshop to be able to see, will they show up? Are, are they learning the trade? Are they able to produce something that will sell? Can you know, all of these factors that are needed when you're in a rural area doing those kinds of activities or, or businesses. And it has been amazing to see how much we've benefited from being able to do that. So that's the example of creating that self-employment workshop. Another example is creating a small business enterprise operated by consumers. This could be a vending machine business or a recycling program. Lenore and I were talking about when Larry Alflin was still with us and he was at Zuni Pueblo in New Mexico. He created an incredible recycling program as services to groups. And then he would take what they would make from doing that and put it back into that um, business. And they taught all kinds of work skills in that business and it was just incredible. My staff and I went and visited and it was just amazing what they were doing. You can develop a computer lab for consumers that, you know, I, I know that many people on this call as well as others have done that. They've created um, computer labs where consumers can come in and job search and do resumes and, you know, all kinds of even those in school can come in and use. Rebecca, we've actually done this and our, our neighboring tribe we serve, um, we approached them because we, we wanted to be able to do this in their community as well, not only our own. And um, one of the things their, their chairman at that time is, is we, we were talking about where would be a good place to put it. And he said, oh, well, I'd like it to be in a place that's open 24 hours a day so that folks can access it, you know, at, at times when, you know, because if it's only during typical office hours, that might not meet everyone's needs. Right. And so it's actually placed in their fire department because the fire department's open 24 hours a day. Wow. And so we have six computers set up in their fire department that folks can access anytime. That is, that's great. But those are wonderful creative ideas. and bringing in your partners to, um, to just increase that collaborative. I mean, 
we all know in our grant writing how much RSA loves when we're collaborating and it's beneficial, very beneficial. So another example is providing technical assistance to businesses so the likelihood of hiring consumers increases. You know, there is a wonderful um, curriculum out there called Windmill, Windmills, um, Changing the Perception of Abilities Training Program. And it is actually a business, it's, it's a curriculum for businesses to learn how to work with people with disabilities. And it, it doesn't just come in and say, here's all the benefits you're gonna get tax-wise. It talks about how do you remove the barriers? How do you remove the biases? How do you work with people with disabilities? This is a service to groups. So a program could say, we're gonna to pull together annually, you know, 10 businesses and provide the windmills training so that they increase in their knowledge of, of employing people with disabilities. So you get a win-win there. You're educating them, but you're also doing networking with businesses that can provide employment for your consumers. Another idea is, again, transition students. You can do tours to universities or colleges, or you can take them on field trips to businesses to learn about job opportunities. Again, those are all services to groups, and those may not go over that $5,000 threshold. You can create an assistive technology loan program that would benefit consumers where you get a store, you get a, sh a shed or something where you store items and then you loan out items and it would be much kind of like a library for um, consumers to have the use of those items. You can also um, do traditional healing ideas. Uh, Lenore had a wonderful one she did in HOMA with a wellness program, which was incredible as a, a traditional healing practice. Do you wanna to talk just to a little bit about that, Lenore? We, um, we started it um, initially because we started seeing and tracking um, in our community just these huge um, increases that just seem to compound every year of mental health issues, just more and more. And our community is very prone to um, disaster. And, and so we, we've seen like with each additional event that takes place, just the stress levels and things like that kind of go through the roof. So we started doing um, a health and wellness program. And so for us is we wanted to look at um, how can we help our consumers um, even address that there are stress issues. Um, we also have a number of folks with substance use. And so it was like, how can we create something that doesn't bring stigma? So we, um, we actually created a program that we started in conjunction actually with the diabetes program. And so folks would come in um, and they would do all their health screenings. We'd test their blood pressure, um, chart their weight, and, and we keep track of that for them so they can come back and see their progress, um, those kinds of things, set goals they may personally want. We check their blood sugar once a year. We would check their cholesterol in more if it was warranted. Um, and then from there, they got to choose one of two things. They could either do um, an ionic foot detox um, that helps with stress relief, or they could do auricular acupuncture that's actually used for um, drug cessation uh, cessation re reduction and uh but it also helps with relaxation as well and so folks could come in participate in that and it was all open room so it's not the medical model by any means it's very non-confidential um but it, it was like group therapy you know of, of people coming and visiting and they come in in groups together and that kind of stuff and they would they sit and chat and talk and, and, and just spend time with, with one another. And so it was an opportunity we felt at least like once a week come in and you could get a break. And I actually had a chance to experience that a few years ago and I, it was incredible just to see the, the interaction and really in my opinion, traditional healing, uh, it's one of its best practices. So um, kudos to you because that was amazing. So we want to hear now from those of you who've actually implemented things. We've got tons of ideas and we don't want to dismiss any of those, but what do you want to share? We'd like you to go ahead and unmute yourself. What would you like to share about something you've done that has worked or 
maybe you just want to talk a little bit about the idea that you have and we can bounce around some thoughts about it. I would encourage those of you that are writing in the chat box, if you um, can, if you are microphone friendly. I know sometimes the microphones don't work in your area, but um, perhaps you would like to share what you've written. If not, maybe um, Lenore and Rebecca can read some of these things. So let's just let's see if somebody first wants to say something before be we... brave come on guys we're family here hi this is julie i'll be brave <laughs> and talk a little bit about what our um what the verna program has been doing at glitzy when i first started about two years ago we had a carryover from the previous year that we had to spend the funds and our director at that time came up with an equipment lending program so we've ordered a lot of equipment, um, canoes, and all the equipment to go with that, and the ricing sticks, so people can go out ricing, because we help all the tribes here in Wisconsin. So it's not just for you know our, the tribe that we're located on, it's for any tribe that wants to go ricing and learn how to rice. Um, we've also bought... Um, trapping for trapping fishing supplies ice fishing hunting um, right now we're doing community garden work uh, so giving them supplies for you know ada garden beds um, we're also working on maple syrup equipment to help teach maple syruping so and it was started out you know like i said as carryover funds but in our new five-year grant it was written in there to, so we can continue the project and that's what we've been working on too especially since we're going to have a lot of carryover funds too from this year fabulous thank you julie for being brave those are that's fabulous um this is carol from hannibal i can share a couple of things that we've done uh, in the past. Um, we don't have any group things going right now. But <laughs> but Obviously, right? <laughs> actually did try a job club, a group job club during the time we were closed. And it, uh, that, that concept was working okay, but the, the people really didn't have it was early on. We had started before we were closed for COVID. So people started in person and then they were continuing online, but a lot of people didn't have the right equipment at that time to do it but i think it, it would be something that would work um, in the past we've done like computer classes where we've had we've hired an instructor from the college for example to come in and teach at hannibal and some of the we, we have 10 computers in our computer lab so we could have uh, up to 10 people so we could fill up the classroom and then everybody wasn't necessarily one of our clients okay but they you know, or other people that wanted to learn those skills and there was really no extra cost for them, but we got a really quality instructor because we had quite a few people in the class, we could justify it. And she also did a clerical training that was more like that substituting for receptionists, which is one job that we have here for people if they're starting back into the workforce and they wanna just work part-time or as a temporary worker. Um, and she, she did that as well. And then I just wanted to mention with the, um, the small business training workshops, we've done, we've done those, but we have been able to do those for free because the um, Small Business Development Corporation, which is available in every state, um, the local person um, that does that for the up, up, kind of heads it up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, she um, provides that service for us. And so she will teach the class and then she does individual follow-up appointments with people to help them develop a business plan and that sort of thing. In fact, she was here yesterday meeting with someone. Um, she's back now after their, their COVID closure. So, and that's been, she's very knowledgeable and um, actually it costs us nothing. Wow. So that would be something to check out um, too. And, she, and she's, she's exceptional, but anyway, those are just a few ideas, but we really like them because it, one, one, we always look at integration and not people with disabilities being taught in isolation. 
So having it integrated where not everybody's a consumer or client of your program mixes it up. And so everybody's learning together like um, we would like. So that's, that's another real advantage of it. Fabulous ideas, fabulous, and, and things that have worked. And, and they've worked and we, we've, done it, we've done them several times. You know, that um, now we're, right now we're looking for it because we're trying to adapt to see how we could adapt some of these ideas to, to do it virtually. So that's, that's where we are right now. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Carol, for sharing yeah. that. Pairing can be challenging, but uh, fast and this easy. is Karen. I work in, um, I work with um, Glitzy's um, small business program and the local um, economic development corporation because the local county has a grant that will supply a lot of the small business training. They'll help write the business plan. They'll follow the person for three years once the business is open. They'll do the, uh, the financial portion of it. And they'll also do um, the check to see how that business will work within the community. So it's a, it's a really good opportunity um, to help the person interconnect with the county as well as um, with tribal services. And um, it's been pretty successful so far in, in terms of helping people understand the, um, uh, the financial portion of the business they want to be so you know, passionate about and that someone will be there to uh, follow up with them for three years, uh, you know, to make sure that they're continuing to be successful. That's great. Well, and you also, Karen, put on here that you guys partnered for summer employment for your transition students. Yes, that was uh, Maria um, up in Bad River and Red Cliff and um, uh, by Lake Superior. And she and Division of Book Rehab for the state of Wisconsin partnered uh, to provide summer jobs. And we provided um, the paperwork basically for the priets and gas cards so that the parents could afford to take the kids into, into the jobs. And DVR uh, worked with a, I think it was um, Work, Workforce Innovative Act to, um, provide the paychecks. Um, so we, it was a very successful program. Um, I know they did cover it at KNR one year, um, but they did it again this summer. We were going to try and do it at, with the St. Croix tribe where, where I typically work, but unfortunately um, COVID shut us down and we really weren't able to regroup to make that happen this year for more than the tribes where it was already happening. Right. But what a great opportunity to do some collaboration and pull together that I love those ideas. Um, somebody else want to share before we read some of the comments in the, the chat box. So Lenora, would you like to read some of the comments that have been said? Sure. Um, one of the things Angie um, shared was University of Alaska Anchorage Center for Human Development offers the micro enterprise grant annually to individuals who experience TBI, substance dependence and remission, mental health disorders, not just Alaska Native American Indians a mini grant of over 10,000 to support their self-employment. I would love to see that for native crafters, but don't know how to implement that. There are seldom American Indian Alaska natives who do apply for the micro enterprise grant. Any ideas? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> um, I think we have had like one or two um, Alaska Native or American Indians who did apply for it. And th they were, um, 
I think they were awarded, but um, it's it's a pretty um, uh, lots of paperwork involved, um, a lot okay. of you know. Uh, but I would like to see you know more um, native people apply for it because that can be a continuation for after TVR. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things is is because that's a nice chunk of money for anybody doing self employment is is if there is and and so one quick question, Angie, can a person receive it over and over again or is it a one time? I think it is a one time unless there's gotcha. been a significant change. Gotcha. So the thought that comes to my mind is, is if there's somebody that is particularly skilled at writing these, that they can teach other folks. Um, you know, sometimes it's like grant writing. It's um, once you kind of learn the skill and learn kind of the lingo and what they like, they can potentially, um, yeah, did they call? Okay, I'm sorry. Um, they can potentially teach that and pass it on to other folks. Um, so I think if, if there is the possibility of someone who has been successful and kind of knows that formula, or there are other folks they can train and teach. Um, Cause it, 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 and if it is extraordinarily cumbersome, I can see where for a lot of native folks that, that tends to be a bit overwhelming. And so, you know, being able to have someone that, that's willing to help and, and do that is, you know, and kind of demystify that process. So I, I'd like to take just a second and, and uh, Karen, you, you said, can we assist with pop-up markets to assist our consumers sell their work? Actually, if you have consumers in self-employment, you can actually write some of those things right into their plans. It wouldn't necessarily be a services to groups, but it could be. You could have a group of self-employment consumers that you bring together, and then you provide opportunity to do that at one of the, the markets. So it could be, but it also could be individually put into someone's plan. And can uh, an independent living center help with um, paperwork? So help with paperwork in terms of what um, Angie and Lenore were talking about. Yeah, in terms of there's a lot of paperwork and um, when our small Avers programs, because they are small, wouldn't have the ability to help with an extensive, maybe extensive um, filling out of paperwork, maybe um, an independent living center can be a partner. Because yeah. they're they're about resources, right? Well, yeah, kind of. That's not their primary focus. Um, you know, I mean, I think I think anybody could be a partner. So you could bring in your partners that could help with some of the the things that are being that sure. are difficult to carry through with. So I think we should be partnering with our independent living centers, but more for other services they provide um, and a lot of times none of them come out to see any of our programs because we're rural and they aren't so well said <laughs> any more you want to read lenore from the chat box there's a, a gazillion ideas i mean maybe <laughs> no. i probably missed a ton um going through it those are the ones that kind of jumped out at me um i i would love to um just kind of plant that seed i i i think in the one area we have not um adequately really thought about services to groups because i think it's an area within tribal programs a lot of people have struggled on how to um to really do um, the traditional healing. And so if it is more, you know, that's my kind of final pitch, I guess, so to speak is, is if there's a way within your own tribe on how traditional healing, what it looks like, what it feels like, 
um, that it, that that is more appropriate in a group setting, then I think you you need to make that justification. Right. That's good. We we want to put a plug in right now and and let you all know that. If you want CRC credit for this, or you want that completion certificate for having attended this webinar, make sure that you email Avertac at the email address. Um, maybe John, you could put in that email address again. And then Lenore and I are really going to encourage you strongly to go and do the evaluation. The link is showing up here in the PowerPoint. It's also in the chat box. It'll also be emailed to you when, when the completion of the webinar is over. But this is really important because as you know, the, the various different technical assistant programs that have worked with, with TVRs, they got a year extension in their funding, but then they're gonna be coming up for additional funding and um, writing grants and so these evaluations help them to be able to write into their proposals how effective their services have been in meeting the needs of the TVR. So please, 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 we're asking you to complete those evaluations. Anything you want to say about that, Lenore? No, I mean, and it's just important. I mean, it tells us if we've done a good job. It also tells us, is, is there more training on this topic that needs to be done? Um, you know, it, it, it's hugely important in a lot of ways. We also want to point out that on Tuesday, there's a webinar, another webinar that AverTech is doing on AVERS and state VR collaborative partnerships and maintaining linkages. This is going to be a, an, a discussion with some former Avers directors, and this is going to be on the Facebook platform. And so we invite you to be a part of that. Um, if you haven't already gotten an email about it, you definitely will. So we encourage you to be a part of that discussion. And then if you, for any reason, need additional support or technical assistance, please reach out to AverTAC. Here's how you can contact them. They're fabulous in being able to do what they can to provide assistance in the areas that you need. So any final comments or thoughts from you, Lenore? Thank you guys so much for carving out a portion of your day to be with us. Yeah. We appreciate you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone so much. Thank you for sharing that picture, Kim. Oh, there's the one with they the, did the, one yeah, on the... They did the staircase one also. Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Your side put that on. <laughs> the photo, not mine, I mean. Yeah. Take that, John. No problem. Yes, John is always our silent background guy. <laughs> once the, the webinar is in process, but oh, we cannot do without that man. <laughs> Thank you, John, for everything. Um, great work. Yeah, it was a very good webinar. Thank you, Rebecca and Lenore. Did Lenore sign off? Yeah, I think she had a she had a twelve thirty phone call. She had to be on. So, hey, Christopher, good to see you this morning. Thanks, you too. It was a great, great one. It was a good one. Thank you for your questions and comments. You did a great job throughout the whole. Uh, <laughs> really good. Good. <laughs> Thank you.